So in this ayat, Allah is promising and ensuring that after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there will be at least three rightly guided khulafa. If the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have specified that after me Abu Bakr is to be the Amir, then everybody would have had to accept him whether they like him or not. In other ways, the Prophet hinted and gave signals that people should know that the man to be chosen for the post of Khilafat is Abu Bakr. Uh, that Ali radiallahu anhu was asked by his own son, who is the best person after Rasulullah, and Ali radiallahu anhu replied, Abu Bakr, and then Omar. My dear brothers and respected elders, we begin in the name of Allah and we thank Him and praise Him and glorify Him. The fact that he's made us in Ahlu Sunnah Wal Jama'ah, the saved sect. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that this Ummah will become divided into 73 sects. Kulluhum fi nari illa millatan wahida. All of them will go into Jahannam except one. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, which is that one? And the Prophet said, Ma ana alayhi wa ashabi. Those who are on my path and the path of my companions. The path of Rasulullah is the path of Sunnah. And his companions are the Sahaba. And they are the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam students, his group, his party as it were. Uh, so Ahlu Sunnah Wal Jama'ah implies the people who follow the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as was observed and practiced and then passed on and presented and given to the rest of the Ummah by his companions. One thing which divides or separates Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah from other people is the question of the succession of Rasulullah. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like other Prophets, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولُ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ أَفَا إِمَّاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَقَابِكُمْ Allah had said that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a messenger of Allah like him. Uh, just as before him there were other messengers, and if he dies or is martyred, will you abandon deen? Uh, no, death is inevitable. Kullu nafsin dha'iqatul maut. Every soul is destined to taste of death. Inna kamayyatun wa inna hum mayyatun. And Allah commanded His beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam rather informed him, you are also to die as are others around you as well. All of them implying this companions and all other people around, everyone has to taste of death. كُلُّ شَيْءٍ هَالِكٌ إِلَّا وَجْهَ Everything is destined to perish except Allah. Allah is the only one who is ever living and shall never die. So when the Prophet ﷺ was eventually to die, obviously then the next obvious thing, well who will succeed the Prophet ﷺ? Many a times people, kings, rulers, uh, they sometimes they nominate their successors, Sometimes successes are not nominated, uh, but rulers deal with them in a manner that they expect other people to understand that this person is next in line to succeed me. When the ruler passes away, then he leaves behind signs, the way he treats, the way he brings up, the way he deals with, with a particular individual from around him, that other people are expected to acknowledge that and to understand from it that after the king, he is to be the ruler. The Prophet ﷺ used to advise people uh, throughout his life that whenever Muslims are together, they need to appoint one responsible person over their affairs. Even when people travel together, even in two or three, uh, they should appoint one as their Amir. Whenever people need to pray together, then they need to appoint one Imam and the rest should pray behind him. And Allah Rabbul Alameen Himself has uh, commanded in the Quran, Ya Yuladina Manu Atiullah wa Atiu Rasula wa Ulil Amri Minkum. Obey Allah, obey his messenger and the people of authority amongst you. So Muslims need to have a ruler like all other communities. And after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah had prophesied 
that wa'ada Allahu alladhina amanu minkum wa 'amilu s-salihati la yastakhlifannahum fil ard Allah makes a promise to those amongst the believe amongst you in this ummah who have belief amanu minkum who are sincere believers wa 'amilu s-salihati and who do good deeds la yastakhlifannahum fil ard that Allah will surely definitely give them the succession of, of, uh, of this earth. In other words, after Rasulullah, uh, they will carry on being rulers. And Allah will affirm their deen, make their deen firm for them, give it solid footing and foundations. The deen which has been chosen for them and which they have chosen. وَلَا يُبَدِّلَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنَا And Allah will surely definitely change their fears into happiness and, and, uh, and rejoicing. Here was a prophecy regarding what was to happen after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because obviously as long as Rasulullah was alive, he was... He was, uh, he was the Imam, he was our Nabi, he was the Imam of the Sahaba, he was their teacher, he was their ruler, he was their commander in chief. The Prophet ﷺ had total authority. Uh, but after the Prophet ﷺ was to leave this world, uh, then this prophecy has been made in Surah An Nur, uh, which is chapter 24, uh, verse 55. Uh, Allah makes a promise, Wa'ad Allah. Alladina Amanu Minkum Allah's promise are with those from amongst you who are believers. And believers mean sincere believers, are uh, not those who simply claim to believe and in their hearts they harbor kufr. Uh, such people are known as Munafiqs. So Allah's promise wasn't with Munafiqs, Allah's promise was with True believers. Uh, believers who are true Ulaika Humul Mu'minuna Hakka. True believers, people whose hearts were decorated and enlightened with the nur of Iman. Allah says about them, أُولَٰئِكَ كَتَبَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمُ iman. And they are those as though Iman has been prescribed. Such sincere, devoted people, Iman has been prescribed in their hearts. وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِهِمُ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانَ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Iman was dearest to them and it had enlightened their hearts. Iman was glowing, flowing in their hearts. So Allah had made, made a promise with such people. Amanu minkum. There were many a people, there were rather some at the time. Allah says in the Quran, in the first Jews, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ they used to claim we believe in Allah and on the last day, but Allah says they are not believers. They were munafiqs. Uh, but the people who were promised khilafa, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ They were those who were true believers. Uh, Allah's Quran uh, promises uh, the promise of Allah of khilafat to those who are sincere believers. Allah and here we ought to also understand just as Allah is Haq, one of Allah's name is Haq. And similarly Allah's word is Haq and Allah's promise is Haq. Ya ayyuhannas inna wa'adallahi Haq. O you people, Allah's promise is Haq. Wa'adallahi la yukhlifu Allahu wa'da. Wa lan yukhlifu Allahu wa'da. In one place Allah says Allah will never go against this promise. Allah doesn't go against His promise and Allah will never go against His promise. And because Allah's promise is absolute, Allah's promise is haq. And Allah had made a promise to give khilafat to who? Those, those who have iman, sincere iman and do good deeds. Here, in this ayat, it's not just that there will be khilafat. Here is multiple khilafat. Just as in Surah al Hazab, Allah makes reference to the daughters of the Prophet. Ya yuhan nabi qul li azwajika wa banatika. Tell your wives and your daughters. Some contemporary Shias think the Prophet only had one daughter. No, the Quran says banatik. 
In the light of the Quran, it is our responsibility to believe that the Prophet ﷺ had at least three daughters. Because for one daughter, the word is bint. Had the Prophet two daughters, then the Quran would have said, Qulli azwajika wa bintayka. Or if the, the Prophet would have had only one daughter, the Quran would have said, Qulli azwajika wa bintika. Or bintayka if he had two daughters. But the Quran says banatika and banat is only fitting for at least three. So we Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah have to believe that the Prophet had at least three. But from Sirah and Hadith we know he had four. And so our Iman Alhamdulillah is in line with Quran. Similarly in this Surah, Surah Al-Nur. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 24, verse 55, Allah says, Amanu minkum. Amanu similarly is a sigha of plural. If there was to be one rightly guided khalifa, according to Shias Ali, radiallahu ta'ala, anu, because when this ayat was revealed, Hassan and Hussein were just very, very young children. And then it goes on to say that Allah will strengthen their deen and change their fears into rejoicing. Allah, وَلَا يُبَدِّلَنَّ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ amna. Their khawf will change into peace. Children have no khawf. They have, you know, especially two, three year olds. Now what do they know? What is going on around them? Uh, so in this surah, in this verse, uh, Allah is making reference to khulafa, not just one khalifa. To Khulafa, because the Quran says Amanu. If it had been one Khalifa, Allah would have said Wa Adallahu Ladi Amana Minkum. Allah makes a promise with him who has iman. But Allah says Allah makes a promise of Khilafat to those. And here again, Amanu means at least three. It's not a singular form. It's not the dual plural form in Arabic. It's the plural form which is fitting for at least three people. So in this ayat, Allah is promising and ensuring that after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there will be at least three rightly guided khulafa who will be sincere believers. Amanu minkum wa amilu salihat and each one of them will have righteous deeds. And so when there will be three, so obviously the first person will be the one who will have the strongest iman and the most precious and sincere of the deeds. When there is a whole list of people, then the one picked out to be number one is obviously the best. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in plain clear terms throughout his life, and never did he specify that after me make bayah of Abu Bakr. <coughs> Ulama have given different reasons to why the Prophet ﷺ did not categorically, clearly, specifically specify Abu Bakr. Number one, if the Prophet ﷺ would have specified that after me Abu Bakr is to be the Amir, then everybody would have had to accept him whether they like him or not. Bismajari, you understand? If the Prophet had assigned Abu Bakr to be Khalifa, then everybody else would have had to accept him as the Khalifa. Some people might have liked it, some might not have liked it. That's the one reason. But so because Rasulullah sallallahu did not specify him clearly, in other ways the Prophet hinted and gave signals that people should know that the man to be chosen for the post of Khilafat is Abu Bakr. And we will address that shortly inshallah. Uh, but the reason why the Prophet did not is so that if he had, then people would have had no option. Well, the Prophet has assigned him, so we have to, we have to put up with him. But now that because they chose him, so because you've chosen him yourself, you are obliged to obey him. And then secondly, the second main reason why the Prophet ﷺ did not specify Abu Bakr anhu as the Khalifa uh, was so that Abu Bakr anhu himself, he would feel the responsibility because the people have appointed him, he would and agreed to have him as their ruler, he will give them the appreciation, understanding and importance uh, that if he is, does anything wrong, then they have a right to check him. Then they have a right to hold him account to account. 
and, ha- and hold him accountable. If he had been appointed by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then if he, na'uzubillah, not that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu ever did anything wrong or put a foot out of place. Uh, no. Uh, many people think, <laughs> Abu Bakr, uh, we read things about him, I read things and I know things about Abu Bakr as Siddiq which don't allow me to follow him blindly. Well, what is it about Abu Bakr? Even one thing in his entire life which he went against the Quran or any clear saying of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No, not that Abu Bakr ever did. Abu Bakr never Never did he go against the Qur'an or a clear uh, saying or a practice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, <laughs> Allahu Akbar, the whole knowledge of all the Sahaba put together, Abu Bakr's knowledge was superior. Abu Bakr's understanding of the Qur'an and the sunnah of Rasulullah, his teachings and sayings uh, was superior to the combined knowledge of Sahaba. Allahu Akbar. But... The Prophet ﷺ wanted him uh, to feel accountable that if he does anything wrong, then the people have a right uh, to put him to check. So Abu Bakr when he was appointed as the Khalifa and he agreed to accept the responsibility, he said to the people, Oh people, if I rule over you according to the Quran and Sunnah, then obey me. And if I do otherwise, uh, then advise me. Obviously he wasn't going to say, and no man has any right to say that you have to follow me and hook, hook, hook. whatever I say, uh, that is only fitting for Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, uh, no one has ever uh, in the 13th century, in the 14th century rather, 14 centuries of Islam, no one has been able to show anything, even a single action of Abu Bakr, uh, that he put a foot wrong against the Quran, or a clear saying, or a teaching, or a practice of the Prophet ﷺ. There are many contemporary, modern, supposed, supposed Salafi, uh, supposed Sunni scholars who say, we read things about him and we know things about Abu Bakr that don't allow us to follow him blindly. Well, sadly, uh, and Allahu Akbar, these are germs they have caught from the Shias. Uh, germs, severe infections of pride and arrogance and hatred. How dare anybody open their lips against Abu Bakr? And the man in whose lap the beloved Prophet of Allah left this ummah, his noble ummah, khaira ummatin, and the Prophet wasallam, while he was still alive. There were many incidents in the life of Rasulullah wasallam, uh, which led people to believe and know that after Rasulullah Abu Bakr deserves to be Khalifa. Not only the Muslims, even the kuffar were aware after Rasulullah the best man is Abu Bakr. During the night of Hijrah, when the Prophet left Makkah to proceed towards Medina, and the Mushrikeen of Makkah put up a reward, 100 camels. They put up a reward of 100 camels for Rasulullah, and they put up a reward of 100 camels for Abu Bakr. Huh. They considered Abu Bakr on par terms with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 100 camels for Rasulullah, 100 camels for Abu Bakr. When in the battle of Uhud, there was initially a rumor uh, that Rasulullah has been martyred. And Abu Sufyan called out, uh, where is Muhammad? The Prophet ﷺ kept quiet. Then Abu Sufyan said, where is Abu Bakr? The Prophet said to the people, keep quiet. Then Abu Sufyan said, where is Omar? Even Abu Sufyan, before accepting Islam, uh, in the days of Jahiliyyah, even he was aware, after Rasulullah, it's Abu Bakr. Then after Abu Bakr, it is Umar. When the Prophet ﷺ migrated from Makkah to Medina, and he reached Medina, started building a masjid, the Prophet ﷺ himself, he personally participated in laying the foundation. He brought a stone and laid the first stone for the foundation of Masjid al Nabi. Then the Prophet asked Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr, you put a stone next to my stone. Then he asked Omar, Omar, you put a stone next to Abu Bakr's stone. Uh, the Prophet, Abu Bakr and Omar. When Omar radiallahu ta'ala was martyred and his janazah was presented and prepared and ready to be prayed, Imam Bukhari Ramallah has brought this narration uh, that Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu he says, 
we were standing by the janazah of Umar radiallahu anhu, when a man from behind put his hand on my shoulder and he said, I always knew uh, you will be buried next to your friends Abu Bakr and Umar because on so many occasions I had heard the Prophet saying, Ana wa Abu Bakr wa Umar, me and Abu Bakr and Umar, I did this fault of Ana wa Abu Bakr wa Umar, I did this and so did Abu Bakr and so did Umar, iltafaytu Ana wa Abu Bakr wa Umar, I I thought about this and so did Abu Bakr and Umar. I did this and Abu Bakr and Umar. When the beloved Prophet of Allah went to rest underground, Abu Bakr joined him. I knew Umar, you will also join them. Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu says, I looked around, it was none than Ali ibn Abi Tahib radiallahu anhu. Even Ali radiallahu anhu knew uh, the sequence of affairs. The Prophet وسلم, to be followed by Abu Bakr, to be followed by Umar radiallahu anhu. One of us, Ali radiallahu anhu, sons, his elder sons, after Hassan and Hussein, uh, was Muhammad bin Hanafiya. And he was born to Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu through a woman given by Abu Bakr to Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu. Uh, through a woman given as a wife to Ab Ali radiallahu anhu by Hazrat Abu Bakr. Her name was Khawla and she was from the same clan as Musaylimah Kazab. When Abu Bakr anhu sent as a Khalid ibn Walid to deal with Musaylimah and he came back victorious with, with many captives, Abu Bakr anhu saw Khawla and he said, and he said to us, Ali, Ali, take her and I am hopeful Allah will put barakah in your family through her. And through her, Muhammad I was born. His name was also, uh, he was referred to as Muhammad Akbar. Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu had many sons. Allah gifted him. Some say 14, some 15, some have mentioned even more, but 14 are unanimously agreed. Uh, one of them uh, was Muhammad Akbar. He's also known as Muhammad bin Hanafiya. And he said, Sa'altu abi an ayyin nasi khayrun ba'da nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, I asked my father, Hazrat Ali, on who is the best person in this ummah after Rasulullah. And he said, Abu Bakr. Then he says, Qultu thumma man, who, who, who after Abu Bakr? He said, Umar. He said, Wa khashitu an yaqula Uthman, fa qultu thumma anta. And then Muhammad bin Hanafiya says, I was afraid that if I said who next, he would say Uthman. So I said, then was it you after Umar? He said, no, ma ana illa rajulun min al muslimin. I was only an ordinary man from amongst the Muslims. So Ali radiallahu anhu knew and he recognized uh, and he accepted after Rasulullah and the best person is Abu Bakr than Umar. And the Muhaddisun have stated this hadith uh, isn't a khabre wahid. It's a mutawatir hadith being reported through around 80 different asnad and chains. It's a sound, authentic hadith in which there is no doubt and it's been reported by 80 different narrations and chains and asnad uh, that Ali radiallahu anhu was asked by his own son who is the best person after Rasulullah and Ali radiallahu anhu replied Abu Bakr and then Umar. Allahu Akbar. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam finally fell ill, after completion of the message, Al Yawma Akmal Tulakum Dina Kum Atumam Tu Alaikum Niamati Waradito Lakum Ul Islam had been revealed. Another difference between Sunnis and Shias is we regard Khilafat to be a managerial post. Obviously, the Ummah has to get along. You need some sort of uh, ruling system in place. Nabuwat has come to an end. So, the system goes on and organization, society, life goes on. And uh, so how do Muslims base the appointment of their rulers? Is it a religious matter or is it a simply a matter of management? To the Shias, this is a fundamental religious issue. The appointment of an Imam or a leader or a Khalifa, this is of religious significance. It's a part of their Iman. To Alu Sunnah wal Jama'ah, Hadeen has been completed and this is not a fundamental part of Deen. It's a part of our daily way of life. Muslims have otherwise, or oh, every Khalifa, every Khalifa would as though he would be divinely 
divinely appointed and it would be you, you will not be able to do anything with regards to the appointment of any leaders and the fact that the appointment of a khalifa is not a fundamental part of our deen it's a part of our society and affairs we have to have a ruler huh? but the fact who the ruler should be is it divinely is it divinely appointed or is it to be chosen amongst the people if it is divinely appointed in other words from allah then to reject him or oppose him would be kufr. And when we see in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, deen was completed in the plain of Arafah. It was completed where? When? On the 9th of Zilhaj, when the Prophet performed Hajj. It was a Friday in the plain of Arafah. Tenth year after Hijrah, deen was completed. And Allah revealed verses, Al yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا That today I have perfected your deen. According to Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, our Mufassirun, Muhaddisun, Ulama, this, was, this took place on the 9th of Zilhaj, on a Friday in the plain of Arafah. Shias, they believe that it was revealed there and later on at another place as well. Some verses of Quran were revealed number of times. Like Surah Fatiha was revealed on a number of different occasions. But in Surah Fatiha, when we read, there is nothing which specifies any time scale or time bound. All praises for Allah, Lord of the world, the most gracious, the most merciful, owner of the day of judgment, thee alone we worship, thee alone we ask for help. Guide us to the right path, the path of those whom you have favored, and not the path of those with whom you were angry and those who were led astray. General praise of Allah. So if it was revealed once, twice, three times, four times, no problem. But this verse, Al Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum, can only be revealed once. Why? Because it's time specific. It makes mention today I have perfected your deen. So if this was revealed on the 9th of, of Arafah, in the plain of, uh, on the 9th of Zul in the plain of Arafah, it can't be revealed again on Ghadir Khum, as they say, when the Prophet was returning from Hajj, en route uh, he, to Medina, he stopped at a place, there was an argument between Hazrat Ali and another Sahabi, and the argument got out of hand. The Prophet ﷺ was made aware and then he came, contained the situation and then spoke to the people about Ali radiallahu anhu that Man kuntu maulahu fa aliyun maulahu Who's ever I am guardian of, then Ali is also his master and his guardian. And then they say, then the ayat was revealed again. Al yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum That today I have perfected your deen. If that was to be the case, then either it wasn't revealed in the first instance and if it was, then it can't be revealed in the second instance because you can't have completion taking place twice. Samajari, you understand? Agar pehle din mukammal ho chuka hai, to phir ab iski zarurat nahi. Or agar ab zarurat hai, to phir pehle mukammal nahi hua. And then they say from this 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 saying of Rasulullah that whosoever I am master of Ali is also his master. Then this endorsed the Khilafat of Ali radiallahu ta'ala no? And so because deen was completed then, so the acknowledgement of his imamat and Khilafat is a part of deen. And whosoever shall reject it, uh, his deen is naqis, he is rejecting a command of Allah and amr of Allah, which is not the case. And because Deen was completed in the plain of Arafah by the revelation of the ayat Al Yawma Akmal Tulakum Deenakum. So anything subsequent to that, anything after that does not form a fundamental of our deen because deen has already been completed. So even from this, if people were to assume Khilafat, so even if people go against it, this doesn't go against deen because deen has already been completed. But the Prophet ﷺ wasn't implying the Khilafat of Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu because when the Prophet then returned to Medina and the end of Zul Hajj, month of Muharram passed, month of Safar set in, towards the end of the month of Safar, Rasulullah ﷺ fell ill. And having fallen ill, then few days before his 
demise, few days before Rasulullah left this world, he was surrounded by companions and he asked the people for some ink and some paper. This is known as the incident of Qirtas, the incident of the ink and paper. And the Prophet wasallam, what he wanted to do was, he said, I, want to, I wanted to dictate something so that you will never become misled after me. From here the Shias deduce that the Prophet wanted to appoint his successor. And the Prophet said, I want to dictate something by which you will never become misled. And, and the people started raising their voices. Umar radiallahu anhu said, don't bother Rasulullah, he's become very weak. We have the book of Allah amongst us. There is nothing new that the Prophet is going to dictate and teach and tell us. Deen has been completed. We have the book of Allah, so we don't need anything. Don't bother the Prophet wasallam. Now when somebody makes a, a remark like that, is it out of rebellion or is it out of sympathy? Huh? Sympathy and loyalty and obedience. The man, Rasulullah, the beloved Prophet of Allah is not well, so put in, putting him through unnecessary bother, there is no need. So he was saying it out of love, out of obedience, out of sympathy. The Shias, they say, no, because the Prophet wasallam speaks as he has been divinely required to speak. So when the Prophet requested something or commanded something to then challenge that command is Sarih Kufr. So they say Umar Nauzubillah committed Kufr at that instance. In any case, at that point the incident was ended. Other people went home. Hazrat Umar radiallahu had his own family, he went home. Now Ali radiallahu ta'ala, no, he was the Prophet's cousin and son-in-law. He was amongst the closest to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if the Prophet had wanted to dictate the Khilafat of Ali radiallahu ta'ala, no, then Hazrat Ali, he was with Rasulullah most of the time. So if we, if we say, okay, Umar radiallahu ta'ala, no, he, he asked the people to leave matters as they were. Well, why did Ali radiallahu ta'ala, no, why did he not take the initiative and then take it upon himself because he was from the close members of the family. So being close member of the family, like the secretary of Rasulullah, because on other occasions when the Prophet needed to deal with non-Muslims, Ali radiallahu anhu was given the responsibility and, 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 uh, and the honor of writing things on behalf of Rasulullah. So here, if the Prophet wanted to have something written, the responsibility was primarily more upon Ali than Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. So if Umar radiallahu anhu said something, then Ali radiallahu anhu being close to the Prophet had the opportunity to override that. And Umar radiallahu anhu, when he went home after that, Hazrat Ali was still around and he spent more time because he was a close family member with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the time. So he should have looked for an opportunity, given something to Rasulullah for him to write or dictate, and then the matter would have been settled. Shias they say, well the Prophet wanted to dictate and appoint who should be his successor. Now if on this instance the Prophet wanted to appoint a successor, then we have to accept that what happened on ghadir e khum that the Prophet did not meant to be him success. What the Prophet said, Man kuntu maulahu fa aliyun maulahu. Huh? If the Prophet now wanted to appoint a successor, that means what he said there on the pond, that did not mean that he was to be the Prophet's successor. If he has already made it clear, then why was there another need only a few days later to do the same thing? So if the Prophet now wanted to appoint a successor, then you have to acknowledge and accept that on Ghadir Khum, on the pond, where there was an argument that the Prophet hadn't appointed a successor. Because that took place in front of people. Here there were only a few people. And if the Prophet ﷺ wanted to appoint a successor, he was going to be the successor or the ruler, successor of Rasulullah over the whole Ummah. And such an important affair, it's not an ordinary thing. 
it's a very important affair which affects and which affects the whole ummah so such an issue should have been resolved either in makkah in the plain of arafa or the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam should have waited until he got back to medina and then do it properly there not in the middle of the desert somewhere you understand <laughs> the appointment of a successor bhi agar khalifa ko namzad karna tha to ya to wo arafat mein karte jahan yani hazaron ka majma tha lakhon ka ya phir wapas medina munawwara aakar karte logon ke samne tasalli ke sath jangal mein ek darakht ke niche under a tree on a pond where there are only few people it would be fitting for such a important mission uh, so it shows if the prophet wanted to appoint a successor here in his dying moments uh, he hadn't appointed one if he had appointed one then he wouldn't be doing it now and in any case even if it was that the prophet wanted to appoint a successor what is it which leads us to believe that the prophet wanted to appoint as an ali he could have wanted to appoint abu bakr because zaruri nahi na ke hazur hazrat ali ka naam hi aage karte ke after meets to be ali when the prophet didn't specify it didn't make clear on that instance so what is it on which the shias base their whole argument that the prophet wanted to appoint as an ali it could have been abu bakr and it was more likely to to be abu bakr because through other incidents we know if anything it would have been abu bakr but this issue when we look at what the prophet said we it leads us to believe it had nothing to do with khilafat because the prophet said i want to tell you things which will by which you will never become astray again main wo batana chahta hu jin ko agar tum kabu mein rakho to kabhi gumrah na hoge even if it was for the appointment of the khalifa that khalifa would only be there few years even if he was to be hazrat ali 20 30 40 years after that hazrat ali radhiyallahu anhu would go through his his mouth his he will he will die then even if the prophet wanted to appoint hasan radhiyallahu anhu afterwards after hazrat ali then hazrat hasan within 50 60 years he will also die as was the case so it could have only been for something which concerns 50 60 70 years because what was to happen beyond is only in the knowledge of allah so when the prophet said he wants to dictate something by which you will never go astray it shows it wasn't to do with khilafat it was to do with other fundamentals of deen uh, which have already been stated in the quran and through the practice of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so it shows it wasn't to do with khilafat and if it was to do with khilafat if nauzubillah that umar is guilty then so was hazrat ali because he had plenty of opportunity afterwards and if the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had wanted to write something crucially important later on after this the prophet did remain alive for a few days then he would have on another occasion uh, summoned the same thing and then dictated what he wanted to dictate but so when the prophet did not do it it shows it wasn't something of extreme significant as such as appointment of a khalifa the, and then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam fell ill there were two instances in the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life in which he had an opportunity to appoint someone as a representative in his absence in his absence and in his presence once in his absence and one in his presence and they are both fundamentals of deen our deen is based on five pillars iman to bear witness there is no god other than allah and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his messenger salat fasting zakat and hajj five pillars of islam iman or the shahada first one is a secret no one knows what's really in a person's heart fasting is similarly personal if a person gets up to have a sari with the rest of the family and he has he, mashallah as much as he can then he comes to the masjid has iftari uh, with the whole community at iftar time as well that doesn't necessarily mean he's been fasting throughout the day <laughs> fasting is a personal affair who whether he really was fasting or not is between him and allah so fasting is personal zakat everybody is not obliged to pay because it's only obligatory upon those 
who can afford it. And even zakat is usually paid secretly. Uh, it, people don't generally announce, tomorrow I'm going to pay my zakat, whoever wants a share, come and collect it. Uh, that's not the way zakat is, 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 is paid. Uh, but there are, there are two pillars, two ibadat, which are done publicly. And which Muslims are required to do publicly. And that one is salat and one is hajj. Hajj is done in the presence of the whole ummah or at least representative from throughout you know, various different parts of the world. And in the time of Rasulullah with representative from all over Arabia. And salat is prayed in front of the whole community. In the ninth year after hijrah, after the, the conquest of Makkah, the Prophet ﷺ himself did not go to perform Hajj. And he sent a group of 300 people in, and appointed Abu Bakr anhu as the Amir over them. And even in the days of Jahiliyyah, before the Prophet ﷺ's declaration of Nubuwat, Hajj was regarded as a very honorable thing. And people used to come from all over Arabia to Makkah to perform Hajj. Hajj was looked up to. And Makkans, and they used to pride themselves in the service of Hujjaj. And Hajj was a big thing even in the days before Islam. And so when the Prophet ﷺ was sending a group of people to perform Hajj, and he didn't go with them personally, and he appointed someone as a Mir, it was an opportunity for the Prophet to let all the Arabs know who the Prophet's representative is, in whose in, who, when the prophets, in, the, in the Prophet's absence, who the Prophet wants the, all the Arabs and all the people to acknowledge as their leader. Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu was around and the Prophet didn't appoint him, he quoted Abu Bakr. When Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu left Medina to Munawwara to proceed towards Makkah, he, had, he, had, he hadn't gone a long way yet when Allah revealed Surah Tawbah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam summoned Hazrat Ali. And in fact, he was commanded by Jibreel to ask Hazrat Ali uh, to take these, these verses which were revealed and announce in the, pe- in the presence of the people, in all the people, uh, the rulings which were there in that surah. And Allahu Akbar. If Allah so wanted, Allah could have revealed them before Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu left, or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could have sent Ali radiallahu anhu with the verses as he did and then said to them, Oh Ali, you tell Abu Bakr to announce and to recite these verses upon the people and to announce what has been, what has been revealed in those verses. Because in those verses, along other things, there was praise of Abu Bakr. Uh, there is a verse in Surah Tawbah in which Allah makes volume, Allah makes mention in such a way that it leaves Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, outstanding amongst all the Sahaba. And if the Prophet had sent Hazrat Ali with these verses and then said to him, oh, Ali, tell Abu Bakr to announce this, it would have been as though Abu Bakr was boasting about himself in his own way. But no, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told Hazrat Ali, you read them and when you read them and you make mention of how special Abu Bakr is, then people will know that the Prophet's cousin, his son-in-law is announcing this. So it carries weight. If Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, had made mention of those verses himself, then it's like praising your own self, which isn't a good thing. Uh, So Allahu Akbar, the wisdom of Allah, uh, that Allah revealed the verses in which Allah makes mention of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu uh, with the Prophet in the cave, izhuma fil ghar, when they were in the cave, thani yathnayni, the two, and the second of the two when they were in the cave, is يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعْنَا When he said, the Prophet said to his companion, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, is the only person mentioned in the Qur'an as a companion of Rasulullah. So to reject his companionship is to reject the Qur'an and which is then implies kufr. Because Abu Bakr is companion of Rasulullah in light of the Qur'an. Allahu Akbar. So Majai, you understand? Yeah. Ah. So it wouldn't have been fitting. So when Abu Bakr anhu took the people to Hajj, the people had an opportunity to realize the beloved Prophet of Allah is not here. People are making Hajj. There are people from all over Arabia doing Hajj. And who is their Amir? 
Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So at Hajj time, and Hajj takes place once a year. And upon Hajj, people come from all over the world. At least at that time, from all over Arabia, people were there. So everybody had an opportunity to see the man representing Rasulullah in one of the fundamentals of Islam is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Then later on when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam fell ill shortly before he left this world. Thursday Maghrib Salat was the last Salat which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam himself led. Throughout the Prophet's life, never, never even once when the Prophet himself was there and he could, did he allow anyone to step on the Musalla. Because prayer is one of the main responsibilities of the Prophets. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ أَنِعْبُدُ اللَّهِ uh, We sent many prophets from amongst the people so that they will lead the people to the worship of Allah. Uh, so leading people to the worship of Allah is a prime responsibility of the prophets. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam similarly, one of his prime responsibilities to teach people to worship Allah properly and the Prophet taught by setting a perfect and a wonderful example. And never was there any opportunity even once, even once when the Prophet himself was there and he said to somebody else, even Abu Bakr or Hazrat Ali, uh, you lead people in Salat and the Prophet prayed behind them. There was one instance when the Prophet was on a journey and he'd gone to relieve himself. It was time for Fajr Salat. The sun was soon to rise and the Sahaba felt that the sun will soon appear and will rise and the time for the Salat will, will lapse. So they appointed Abdurrahman ibn Auf to lead them in Salat. And the Prophet then came and joined them and prayed and completed his Salat behind Abdurrahman ibn Auf radiallahu anhu. So you can imagine how, what a noble Sahabi he was. Uh, but in, the, in his own presence in Medina, never did the Prophet before this occasion appoint anyone to lead people in Salat. He read he, on the Thursday before he left this world, he personally led the people in Maghrib Salat. Then he retired to his Hujra, the Hujra of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And from there at Isha Salat, only a few yards, only a few yards, he felt unable to come to the Musalla, even being carried by two or three Sahaba. And he said to the people, Muru Aba Bakr an yusalli bin nas. Tell the people to tell Abu Bakr. He didn't say, go and tell Abu Bakr to lead you in Salah. I'm saying he should lead. He said, no, you go and you tell Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr come and lead us in Salah. Look at the hikmat. And the wisdom of Rasulullah and the training he's giving his ummah and that you tell him as though you want him to lead you in Salat. Because tomorrow you have to make the choice and when you are required to make the choice, you would have already had the practice and experience of choosing your rightfully deserving leader. Uh, so he said, Murua Abu Bakr and Yusalli bin Nas. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, Ya Rasulullah, my father is very soft-hearted and when he is asked to stand in your place it will be too much for him and I fear he won't be able to cope so but Umar, Umar is well able he's stronger he is well able to lead people in, 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 in this occasion so I suggest please ask him the Prophet Sallallahu became angry he said tell Abu Bakr not Umar Abu Bakr and on one occasion on one occasion, in one of these three days, Abu Bakr anhu came slightly late for Fajr. And Sahaba had appointed or, or asked Hazrat Umar to step forward because the Prophet was unable to come. He hadn't come. Abu Bakr anhu was late. And so the Sahaba said to Hazrat Umar, Umar, you lead us in Salah. He started, he said takbir, started reciting Surat Fatiha. The Prophet ﷺ heard as Umar's voice, the Prophet lifted the curtain and said, No, 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 not Umar, tell Abu Bakr. Hazrat Umar broke his salah. In the meantime, Abu Bakr came, 
he was asked to lead people in salat. Allahu Akbar. And because the Prophet ﷺ has said, and the man with the most knowledge should lead you in salah. The man who knows the Quran should lead the most should lead you in salah. The man with the most taqwa should lead you in salah. So when the Prophet himself appointed Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, uh, and so it proved Abu Bakr was the most knowledgeable. Abu Bakr was the man who knew the best Quran. Abu Bakr was the man who was the, had the most taqwa. So in his presence, uh, no one is fitting, not even Umar, uh, to take the initiative and step in front of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Not once. Uh, 17 prayers. Thursday night, Isha Salat, all day Friday, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and Monday morning Fajr, while the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was alive. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was appointed as the Imam. And Salat is a fundamental pillar of, of, of Islam. In the Quran, Salat has also been referred to as Iman. Because when the Prophet sallallahu was in Makkah and he used to pray, he used to pray in the Kaaba, in front of the Kaaba in such a way, because from Makkah, Baitul Maqdas is in the in a northerly direction. So while the Prophet was in Makkah, he could face the Kaaba in such a way that Baitul Maqdas would also be in front if he prayed from a southerly, from a southerly direction. But because Medina is in the north, between Makkah and Baitul Maqdas and Jerusalem, so when the Prophet migrated from Makkah to Medina, that wasn't possible. And because Baitul Maqdas had been the Qibla of the previous Prophets, so the Prophet continued praying towards Baitul Maqdas for 17 months almost. And then at the desire of Rasulullah, Allah eventually ordered uh, that the Prophet now face Kaaba, Makkah al Mukarramah instead of Jerusalem and, and Batul Maqdis. So when, and then when this command was revealed, some Sahaba thought, well what about our previous prayers which we have already prayed towards Batul Maqdis? Allah said, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيَّ إِمَانَكُمْ Allah will not waste your Iman. Here, Iman implies your Salah. Whatever prayers you have prayed before this, don't worry, they haven't gone wasted. Uh, so, Salat is a, is a very important major pillar of Iman. And he says in Hadith, مَنْ تَرَكَ الصَّلَاةَ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَقَدْ كَفَرْ Whosoever neglects Salat deliberately as though he's committed Kufr. And so the main thing which distinguishes a true believer from a Kafir is his Salah. And when the Prophet was appointing Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu in his, as the Imam of Salah, uh, so it shows in the eyes of Rasulullah, he was the man with the strongest Iman and with the most complete Iman fitting to lead the people. And that is exactly what happened. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa left this world, and then Monday morning around afternoon time, the Prophet left this world and his soul departed from his body. You can imagine the chaos that Sahaba were feeling and the sad sadness and the sorrow which overtook them and gripped them. There were Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he came, he had gone to visit one of his other wives outside Medina and when he heard the Prophet has passed away, he returned to the Prophet's house and the family of the Prophet had then covered his body with a white cloth and he slipped the cloth down from the face of Rasulullah and he kissed his forehead and he said, Tibta hayyaun wa mayyita ya Rasulullah, you are noble when you were alive and similarly having tasted of, of death, you are just as noble. And tears rolling down his cheeks, he then went to the masjid, sat and he stood on the mimbar and he said, Man kana ya'budu Muhammadan fa inna Muhammadan qad maat. After praising Allah, he said, whosoever used to worship Rasulullah, uh, let him know that he has tasted of death. Wa man kana ya'budu Allah fa inna Allah hayyun qayyum. And whosoever used to worship Allah, then Allah is the ever living and shall never die. This is what's happening in the masjid. He delivered a long khutbah which assured and comforted the Sahaba and they were able to cope with it and then realize that death has taken, uh, that, that, that death has come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and it was inevitable, had to happen and it's happened. The natives of Medina, in Medina at the time there were two communities mainly, Muhajireen and Ansar. Muhajireen were those who had migrated to Medina from other clans, many of them from Makkah, 
many from other clans as well. The Ansar was the natives of Medina. They had grown up there, they lived there, and they were the natives. So the Muhajireen and Ansar. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, along with Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Usman, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa they were Muhajirun. And they, were, they had migrated from Makkah and come and settled in Medina. So when this was happening in the masjid, Ansar had gathered in Sada Bani Saqifa, which was like the town hall you could say at that time, uh, to consider the situation and to assess it, and to see who they can appoint as the Khalifa. They wanted, because it was their town, Medina Tul Munawwara was their town, so they felt that the Khalifa should be from amongst them. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu heard uh, that the Ansar had gathered there, so he took as it Umar quickly, <coughs> along with Abu Ubaida ibn Jarrah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and Abu Ubaida, uh, he, was, he, he wasn't an ordinary man either. And the Prophet said, Aminu hadhihi al-Ummah, o Abu Ubaidah. The most trustworthy man in this Ummah was Abu Ubaidah. When Umar radiallahu anhu was about to die, uh, he expressed a wish, and people asked him who they want, uh, who he wants to be his successor. He said, if Abu Ubaidah had been alive today, then I would have had no hesitation in appointing him as to be my successor. Mm. But then he appointed a committee of six people to choose who they want as the Khalifa after him. So he took him along. And because, like we said earlier, and the Prophet ﷺ always used to stress that the Muslims should have a leader. And in every community, a leader is very important. Without a leader, because especially now, uh, that many, in fact, most of the Arabs who'd come into Islam were newcomers. Uh, most people by far had come into Islam after the conquest of Mecca. So most people, uh, had been Muslims one year, six months, one and a half year, two, two years the most. And many were not firm in Islam yet. So when they would have seen the, 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 that the Prophet has passed away, there is no leader. So, you know, it would, have, it would have led to total chaos. So it was absolutely essential that the Muslims appoint their leader and successor to Rasulullah as soon as possible, so who can take control and charge of affairs. So when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu heard that the Ansar were gathering in Sada Bani Saqifah, he took Hazrat Umar and Abu Baida ibn Jarrah immediately and he proceeded towards Sada Bani Saqifah. Now in Sada Bani Saqifah, they want the Muhajirun. Muhajirun were all sitting in the masjid crying over the death of Rasulullah. Not that the Ansar didn't feel it as well. The Ansar felt it as well. But they felt uh, that the first thing first, we need to appoint a successor to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam immediately to take charge of the situation. The Shias, they say, look, they were fighting over Khilafat when the Prophet's body was still lying there. No problem, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa noble body was lying, the funeral arrangements need to be made, but who is responsible generally for the funeral arrangements? The family members, family members were there, as Ali was there, as Abbas was there, as Zubair radiallahu was there, and the Prophet's wives were there, the whole family is there, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he is, yes he is the Prophet's father-in-law, huh? but there are other people, you don't expect someone's father-in-law to make arrangements for burial, the Prophet's son-in-law, as Ali like his own son, he was a grown-up young man at the time. The Prophet's uncle Abbas was there to supervise affairs with his sons, uh, Qusam and Fazl, uh, Fazl bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala. He was a grown-up young man, the Prophet's cousin. As Ali is the Prophet's cousin, son-in-law. As Zubair radiallahu is the Prophet's cousin. Similarly, like his brother, so they are there to look after the funeral arrangements. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu needs to take care of the ummah of Rasulullah. If he delays and things, things just get out of hand, then the chaos which would result would be even more severe. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu proceeded towards Sada Bani Saqifah. All the muhajirin are still in the masjid. Sada Bani Saqifah, who's there? Ansar. And Abu Bakr is not from the Ansar, he's from the muhajirun. And so as though you could say the rival party. There were two main parties. The Muhajirun and Ansar. And Abu Bakr is from the Muhajirun. So he's going to the camp of the other party who were hopeful in appointing their own Khalifa. They were hopeful that the Khalifa should be from them. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he got there, he said, No. 
the Prophet had said, al min al Quraysh, that the rulers will always be from Quraysh. And because the Prophet is from Quraysh, he was a Muhajir, his successor will be a Muhajir. And he said that Aimmatu min al Quraysh, because the Quraysh commanded respect amongst the Arabs. The people of Medina, they were also noble in their own way, but the Arabs as a whole didn't used to look up to the people of Medina, they used to look up to the people of Makkah, the Quraysh. So the Prophet knew that after him this, the only right choice and the appropriate choice will be for the successor to be from the Quraysh. So he said, Al-Aimmatu min al-Quraysh, the people will be from Quraysh. Yes, the Ansar will remain as helpers. Uh, one of the senior leaders of the Ansar was Saad ibn Ubada radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu reminded him, O oh, Saad, you were there when the Prophet had said this. Then Saad radiallahu anhu also remembered. He said, yes, you're right. Antumul umara wa nahnul wuzara. You will be the rulers and we will remain as the advisors. So when Saad radiallahu anhu confessed this, Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, look, here is Umar and Abu Ubaidah, people that the Prophet trusted in his life. And so whosoever you want amongst them, choose him as your, as your ruler, and as your leader, and I will make bayat on their hands. Abu Bakr didn't wish for Khilafat. He did not claim Khilafat. He did not want Khilafat, he did not ask for Khilafat. He wasn't in his own camp, he was in the opposite camp. So people say Abu Bakr and Umar Nauzubillah had been conspiring, waiting. They couldn't wait for the Prophet to die and to assume Khilafat. You can't assume Khilafat. Uh, he was given Khilafat when he said, Umar and Abu Ubaidah, they are here, they have been trusted by Rasulullah. And so whosoever you want, choose him as your leader and I will acknowledge him. Umar radiallahu anhu said, Oh Abu Bakr, how can we, how can anyone step forward in your presence when the Prophet had, had put you forward for prayers and you have been referred to as the San Yasnain, as the second of the two in the Quran, uh, in, with reference to the night of the Hijrah. So who dares step in front of you in your presence? So you, you, you give us your hand and we will make your bayat. And as soon as uh, Azat Umar radiallahu anhu made this mention, then nobody had any objection. Everybody knew that the Khalifa had to be from the Muhajir, and who dare in the presence of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu make any claim? Abu Bakr didn't claim. He did not ask. He did not demand. He suggested otherwise. People then made him Khalifa. And not in his own camp, in the rival camp, in the camp of Ansar. Not in the camp of Muhajirun. Whoever was there, they made his bayat. They came to the Masjid al Nabawi. Whoever was there, uh, he was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu made the issue clear. And everybody who was there accepted Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu as the Khalifa. And funeral arrangements in the meantime were taking place. We have been advised, it says in Hadith, don't delay in three things. In Salat, when its time sets in, the marriage of an unmarried woman when a suitable partner is found and a funeral as soon as it is ready to be prayed. Why? Particularly in those days there were no fridges, cold stores and so as soon as a person dies if he is not buried in those very hot climates and when you bear in mind it was like it was in summer because Ulama said when the Prophet performed Hajj it was around April and the Prophet passed away in about July. So 50 degrees and to leave an ordinary body in 50 degrees even after a few hours ordinary person will begin to smell. But the Prophet wasn't an ordinary person. He was a Nabi Allah and there was assurance and that the, Allahu Akbar, the bodies of the Prophets don't rot and smell. Uh, so there wasn't that urgency that the Prophet needs immediate burying uh, because the pr bodies of the Prophets don't rot and smell like ordinary, pro like ordinary bodies. 
Uh, and there are dalail, and sufficient dalail to prove that. Ordinary person, when we sweat, we give off B.O. But Rasulullah, when he would sweat, Allahu Akbar, Azwaj mutahharat, our mothers, they would collect the Prophet's perspirations and store them in bottles. And Allahu Akbar, they were, and that was more fragrant than the most fragrance of the musks. And the Prophet's bodies are special. And so that was assured that there was no need to worry anything will happen because nothing was going to happen. And so in the meantime, the Prophet's body was prepared, and washed and, and coffined. And in the meantime, the news spread everywhere, Allahu Akbar, and people came, flocked from all over, around Medina, 30,000 people. Whosoever heard immediately came to Medina. And the Prophet's Janaza was laid, and, pre- and, and, and Abu Bakr anhu was amongst the first, along with Azad Umar and other family members, to pray first upon the Prophet. And the Shias, they say, oh, look, they were fighting over Khilafat, and they didn't even pray the Janaza of Rasulullah. Anauzubillah, that is a load of rubbish. And Janaza wasn't prayed in public as it is for ordinary people, but then Rasulullah was at an ordinary man. A special prophet of Allah, Kha Sayyidul Mursaleen, Khatamun Nabiyeen, Rahmatulil Alameen. He had given instructions to how his Janaza should be prayed. And the Prophet had said, After I die, wash me, then leave me. For a while, Allah will send angels to pray over me. Then people should come and pray in small groups. That's exactly what Sahaba did. And small groups they prayed. 30,000 people wanted to pray. And so even if a small group in the Hujra of Aisha radiallahu anha, only 8, 10 people could come in and could be accommodated. And because in the middle of the room was the grave of Rasulullah, so obviously they had to face Qibla from only one side. So there was only enough room for 7, 8 or 10 people at a time. And so they would come and you can you imagine how, how long it will take? Even if each group took 3, 4 minutes, uh, 30,000 people prayed. <laughs> Allahu Akbar took the whole of Monday, the whole of Tuesday and the whole of Wednesday and, and it is said on Wednesday evening the Prophet Wasallam was laid to rest Allahu Akbar in the Hujra of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha uh, so Abu Bakr's Abu Bakr radiallahu's appointment to Khilafat it wasn't his decision he was chosen collectively by Sahaba and after they had confirmation, they were satisfied. The Prophet ﷺ had given many hints throughout his life. He hadn't appointed him clearly, categorically for reasons I have given. Uh, that if he had been appointed, then the people, they would have, had, had, would have felt, oh, we got no choice but to put up with Abu Bakr Nauzubillah. No, because they appointed him, uh, they held him accountable. And if there was anything, not that anybody was ever able to point a finger. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, eventually when his turn came to leave this world, Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu offered, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Khalifa to Rasulullah, allow us, as Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, when I die, I want to be buried in my same clothes. <coughs> Hazrat Ali said, Amir al-Mu'mineen, allow us to give you a new coffin, to, uh, to cloak you in a new pair of, in new clothes. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, no. The living people are more worthy of new clothes. If my deeds are good enough to please Allah, then my, these clothes will be replaced by better clothes. And if my deeds are not good and Allah is not happy with me, then new cloth isn't going to save me, do me any good. So he who didn't even want a coffin, new coffin for himself from the people, how can he, if Khilafat had been the right of Ali radiallahu ta'ala or anybody else, how could Abu Bakr take somebody else's right? Uh, but so it shows, it wasn't Ali radiallahu anhu's right. Ali radiallahu ta'ala was happy uh, to pray behind Abu Bakr and to be and to remain his advisor and by his side throughout. Uh, and people they say, oh Abu Bakr and Omar and Usman, they wronged Azad Ali and the family of Rasulullah. Uh, and the Alul Bayt, and they oppress them, they wrong them. If somebody oppresses you, how do you feel towards them? Uh, you love them, you envy them, you admire them, or you hate them? Uh, if somebody oppresses you, wrongs you, you have something and he takes it away from you, are uh, you going to love him? You're going to admire him? You're going to respect him? Uh, you, will, you will hate him. And people that you hate, uh, you won't name you. One thing you definitely won't do is to name your children after them. 
Uh, and if Abu Bakr and Umar and Usman radiallahu anhu had wronged the family of Rasulullah, then the family of Rasulullah, Ahlul Bayt, Hazrat Ali, Hazrat Hassan and Hussain, they wouldn't have named their children after them. Uh, I was saying Hazrat Ali had 14 sons. One he named, uh, two everybody knows, Hassan and Hussein. Then he named three after Rasulullah, Muhammad, Muhammad Akbar, Muhammad Ausat, Muhammad Asghar. Three and two makes? Five. One he named Abdullah, one Ubaidullah. Seven. Four, he named after his family members. Jafar, Yahya, Aun and Abbas. That makes? And from 14, how many does that leave? Three. One he named Abu Bakr, one he named Umar, one he named Usman. So if Hazrat Ali felt that Abu Bakr and Umar have wronged me, uh, would he have named his sons after Abu Bakr and Umar and Usman? And Abu Bakr bin Ali, Umar bin Ali, Usman bin Ali, they were with Hazrat Hussein when he was martyred in the plain of Karbala. And these sons of Abu Bakr, of, of Hazrat Ali, Abu Bakr, Umar and Usman bin Ali, Abu Bakr bin Ali, Usman bin Ali, Umar bin Ali, they were with Hazrat Hussein when he was martyred in the plain of Karbala. Then when Hazrat Hussein radiallahu anhu, he grew up, uh, when he grew up, then Allah gave him many sons. Along with his other sons, Hazrat Hassan, he named one Abdullah. And among others, he gave one of his sons the name Abu Bakr, one he gave Umar. Hazrat Hassan had sons by the name of Abu Bakr and Umar. Then Hazrat Hussein, Allah blessed him with sons. Two of his sons, he named one Abu Bakr, one Umar. And then Shias believe in Imams. They believe 12 Imams. Uh, they believe as Ali was the first Imam. Hassan second, Hussein third, then Ali bin Hussein, who's also known as Zainul Abidin. Ali bin Hussein, then Ali radi Ali Rahimahullah, Ali bin Hussein, Zainul Abidin had a son, his name was Muhammad, Muhammad bin Ali. He's also known, known as Imam Muhammad Baqir. Then he had a son, his name was Jafir. He's known as Jafir Sadiq. And the Shia's uh, fiqh is known as Fiqh Jafariya. Just as we have our Sunnah wal Jama'ah have Fiqh Hanfi, Fiqh Shafi, Fiqh Maliki, Hanbali. And the Shias, their Fiqh is known as Fiqh Jafriya. And which is based on the teachings according to their thinking of Imam Jafir Sadiq and the sixth Imam. Hazrat Ali, Hassan, Hussein, Ali bin Hussein, Muhammad bin Ali and Jafir bin Ali. Uh, he's the sixth Imam. Imam Abu Hanifa Ramahullah also spent uh, a few years under Hazrat Jafir. Uh, uh, Jafir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, this, uh, the great great grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was regarded as one of the great fuqaha and muhaddisun of Medina. He died three years before Imam Abu Hanifa. In the year, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah died in 150 AH after Hijrah. Imam Jafir Sadiq passed away in 147 after Hijrah. And uh, Alama Shamsuddin Dhabi has, has mentioned him as one of the great fuqaha and ulama of Medina. Imam Jafir Sadiq radiallahu ta'ala alayhi salam. And uh, Imam Jafir Sadiq had a son named Musa Kazim. He was their seventh Imam. Then his son Ali Raza, his son Muhammad Taqi, his son Ali Naqi. Ali Raza was the eighth Imam, and Muhammad Taqi was the ninth, and uh, 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 Ali Raza, Muhammad Taqi, Ali Naqi, he was the tenth. Hassan Askri was the eleventh, and they said the twelfth Imam was Imam Mahdi, who vanished when he was a young boy. Hazrat Ali had sons named them Abu Bakr, Umar and Usman. Hazrat Hassan named his sons Abu Bakr and Umar. Hazrat Hussein named his sons Abu Bakr and Umar. Then his son uh, Imam Zainul Abidin, he named two of his sons Umar and Usman. Then Imam, Imam Baqir, Imam Jafir Sadiq, Musa Kazim, he named his sons Abu Bakr and Umar. Uh, so as Ali, Hassan, Hussein, uh, Zainul Abidin and Musa Kazim, five of their twelve Imams have named, the, the, who they say are Imams. Uh, we all accept them as Imams, as great scholars, pious people, descendants of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But they say they were their Imams. So five of them have named their children Abu Bakr and Umar and Usman. Another person who stings in their eyes is Aisha radiallahu anha. Uh, in fact, on the YouTube, you will see many clips. And Auzu Billah, and Auzu Billah accusing Hazrat Aisha uh, of poisoning Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And in Hayatul Qulub, Mullah Bakir Majlisi has written that when the twelfth Imam comes, uh, what he will do? He will go to the graveyard and raise Hazrat Aisha, and he will lash her uh, for her part in in the battle against Hazrat Ali and Auzu Billah. <laughs> 
But when we see similarly, if Hazrat Aisha had wronged the Ahl Bayt, would they have named their daughters after Aisha? Huh. Imam Jafar Sadiq's, one of his daughters' name was Aisha. His granddaughter, the daughter of the seventh Imam Musa Kazim, he named her Aisha. The eighth Imam Ali Raza named his daughter Aisha. The tenth Imam Ali Naki named his daughter Aisha. And this is all in Shia books. So if as Aisha, Rahuzubillah, huh, it, it, she, if she had a sore place in their hearts, or if, if she had any differences and they hated her, would they have named their, child, their daughters Aisha? Never. So when they named their daughters Aisha, Imams naming their daughters Aisha, so it shows they respected Aisha. They looked up to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha as as Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, after the battle of Jamal, he said, وَلَهَا حُرْمَتُهَا وَلَهَا بَعْدُ حُرْمَتُهَا الْأُولَى What's happened has happened. She deserves the same respect as she had before this battle of Jamal. She is our mother and she still deserves our love, our obedience and our respect. As Ali respected her and the other children of Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu continued respecting her. The other Imams respected her because she was the true mother of the Ummah. Uh, the woman the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved the most. And another very important part of our deen uh, is, is marriage. Just as namaz is a part of our Iman, the Prophet said marriage is half Iman. Have you heard the hadith? Iza tazawwaj al abdu faqadistakmala nisf al iman. When a person gets married, and they safeguard half their iman. And marriage is a very important step in a person's life. The Prophet ﷺ said, People marry women for, for four reasons. Limaliha, wali jamaliha, wali hasabiha, wali diniha. For their wealth, for their beauty, for their family, and for their piety. Muslims should give preference to piety. Uh, so you think if the Prophet commanded ordinary people to look for pious partners, what about the Ahl Bayt, the descendants of Rasulullah, would they not want to marry pious people? And the Prophet himself, would he not want to marry pious, pious women? Allah has forbidden the Muslims, وَلَا تَنْكِحُ الْمُشْرِكَاتِ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنَّا وَلَا تُنْكِحُ الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنُوا Don't marry mushrik women and don't marry mushrik men until they believe. Even if he's the last Wala Abdun Mu'minun Khairum Mim Mushrikin Wala Wajabakum. A mu'min slave is better, is better than any other mushrik who might please you. Similarly, Wala Amatum Mu'minatun Khairum Mim Mushrikatin Wala Wajabatkum. And if maid servant, a mu'mina is better than any mushrika woman who might please you, who might be misworld even. Allahu Akbar. And someone very pleasing to you, but if he doesn't have Iman, don't marry them. One is a mushrik, one is a munafiq. A munafiq is worse than a mushrik. Because a munafiq, inna al-munafiqina fi darki al-asfali min al-nar. A munafiq will be in the lowest part of Jahannam. Uh, so the Shias, they say, oh, the Prophet was surrounded, na'uzu billah, by munafiqs. And as soon as the Prophet left this world, every kullu mirtaddu, uh, except four. Uh, Abu Zar Ghifari, Salman Farsi, Ammar bin Yasir, Miqdad bin Aswad. Except that other than these four, every one of them, Na'uzu Billah bin Zalik. Uh, Iman wasn't deep rooted in their hearts, Na'uzu Billah. So if that was the case, uh, would the Prophet have married as Aisha? Would Allah have allowed the Prophet to marry as Aisha? Uh, so look. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu gave his daughter to the Prophet in marriage. Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu gave his daughter to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in marriage. So when the Prophet accepted Aisha and Hafsa in his marriage, uh, so what do you think? They were munafika or they were mu'minat? Uh, they were proper mu'minat. They were mother, not just mu'minat, ummahatul mu'mineen. They were the mothers of the believers. Uh, so the Prophet endorsed their iman, Allah endorsed their iman. When Allah gave the Prophet opportunity and his daughter Fatima became ready for marriage, he gave Hazrat Fatima to Hazrat Ali. Hazrat Umar gave his daughter to, Hazrat, to the Prophet. The Prophet gave his daughter to Hazrat Ali. Hazrat Ali completed the circle by giving his daughter Ummi Kulthum to Hazrat Umar. So if Hazrat Ali didn't think that Hazrat Umar was a true believer, would he have given him his daughter Ummi Kulthum? She says, no, no, it wasn't Ummi Kulthum, the daughter of Hazrat Ali. It was another Ummi Kulthum. Because Ummi Kulthum was a very common name. 
The Prophet had a daughter by the name of Umm Kulsum. Hazrat Ali and Hazrat Fatima's daughter was Umm Kulsum. Hazrat Abu Bakr had a daughter by the name of Umm Kulsum. And Hazrat Ali's brother, Jafir, his son Abdullah had also had a daughter by the name of Umm Kulsum. So Umm Kulsum was a very common name. But this Umm Kulsum which Hazrat Umar married was the daughter of Ali and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, the granddaughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah knew there will come many people who will bark at Umar. And they will say, oh no, Umar was like this and Umar was like this. Allah wanted to put assurance policy in place so that nobody in the right frame of mind can dare open his mouth with regards to Umar. When, when Umm Kulsum reached the age where she could be married, Hazrat Umar said to Hazrat Ali, Ali, if you allow me, I want the honor of marrying your daughter, the granddaughter of Rasulullah. <coughs> because I have heard the Prophet saying, all relationships will become useless except my relationship. So although I already have a relationship with Rasulullah through my daughter, but I want to strengthen that relationship. So I feel I deserve to be married to your daughter. Hazrat Ali said, well, I had wanted her to be married to my nephew, Abdullah bin Jafar. Hazrat Jafar was his elder brother. He was martyred in the battle of Muta against the Romans. He had a son. He was a very pious, very generous son, a very good man. And he said, I wanted to give her to him. He said, that's okay, but I feel I deserve more. Please give me this honor. Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu, he agreed. And Hazrat Fatima and Ali radiallahu anhu's daughter, Ummi Kulsum, was given to Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu. So when Hazrat Ali, and by the time, Hazrat Hassan and Hussein had also grown up to be young men. So Hazrat Hassan, Hazrat Hussein, and Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, three of the, rima, of the imams, when they agreed to the marriage of Hazrat Umar with Hazrat Ali's daughter and the sister of Hassan and Hussein, what do you think? They considered him as a true believer or a munafiq? True believer. So Hazrat Ali, Hazrat Umar's nikah with Umm Kulsum endorsed by Hazrat Ali and Hazrat Hassan and Hazrat Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. The, the central figure and, and uh, central figure like I said earlier uh, in the Shia teachings is of Imam Jafir Sadiq, the sixth Imam. And, he, and uh, most of the narrations in Shia scriptures are through Hazrat Jafir Sadiq. And his mother and his grandmother, Imam Jafir Sa, his father was Imam Baqir, but his mother was the granddaughter, was the, was the great granddaughter of Abu Bakr. Just as Abu Bakr spent all his wealth on Rasulullah, he gave his daughter to Rasulullah. Similarly, the descendants of Abu Bakr continued giving their daughters to the Ahl Bayt. And there were many instances when the Ahl Bayt, they took daughters from the descendants of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And just as the Prophet gave two daughters to Hazrat Usman, he gave two daughters to Hazrat Usman, the Ahl Bayt similarly carried on giving their daughters to descendants of Hazrat Usman. Hazrat Abu Bakr's descendants carried on giving daughters to descendants of Rasulullah. And because the Prophet had given two daughters to Usman, the ahl bayt carried on giving their daughters to Hazrat Usman. Hazrat Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he had two daughters. One was Ummul Hassan, one was Ummul Qasim. Hazrat Hassan radiallahu the Prophet's granddaughter, Hazrat, Hazrat Hassan's daughter, Ummul Qasim, uh, she was married to one of the great grandsons of Hazrat Usman radiallahu anhu. Hazrat Hussein radiallahu anhu's two daughters. One was Fatima, one was Sakina. One was Fatima, one was Sakina. Fatima, she was married to Abdullah bin Amr bin Usman radiallahu anhu. Grandson of Hazrat Usman. Sakina, she was in Karbala and she survived as well. Uh, she was married initially to Zaid bin Amr bin Usman. Grandson of Usman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Hazrat um, Usman had another son, his name was Aban. Aban was married to Umm Kulthum, the daughter of Abdullah bin Jafar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And so you see how the Ahl Bayt, and then Aban had a son, his name was Marwan. She was also married to another descendant of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. 
Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala had, had, had three sons. One was Abdullah, one was Abdurrahman, one was Muhammad. Abdurrahman radiallahu ta'ala was a Sahabi. He had a son, his, he, he was also a Sahabi. But Abdurrahman radiallahu ta'ala had a daughter, her name was Hafsa. Hafsa, the daughter of Abdurrahman bin Abi Bakr, the granddaughter of Abu Bakr, she was one of the wives of Hazrat Hassan radiallahu ta'ala. And then Abdurrahman bin Abi Bakr from one of his other daughters, Asma bint Abdurrahman bin Abi Bakr, uh, his daughter, Asma bint Abi Bakr, she had a daughter by the name of Umm Farwa. Abdurrahman, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu two sons, Muhammad and Abdurrahman. Muhammad had a son, his name was Qasim, he was one of the fuqaha of Medina. And Qasim was married to this daughter of Abdurrahman, whose name was Asma. They had a daughter, her name was Umm Farwa. She was the mother of Imam Jafar Sadiq. So Imam Jafar Sadiq used to say, Abu Bakr is my father from two sources. He has given birth to me twice. One from his father's side, from, uh, from Qasim, uh, from Qasim, um, bin Muhammad bin Abi Bakr and Imam Jafir's mother, Umm Farwa, uh, she was Umm Farwa bin Asma bin Abdurrahman bin Abi Bakr. Uh, so I was saying Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's descendants, they continued giving daughters uh, to the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So if they did not have such friendly, brotherly and, and, and relationships, you think they would have carried on giving and taking daughters from each other? Uh, so the fact that they would name their children after Abu Bakr and Umar, and Aisha, it showed they looked up to these Khulafa Rashidun. The fact that they, they took daughters from them, they gave them daughters, Allahu Akbar. And central figures like Imam Jafir Sadiq, Allahu Akbar. His mother, Allahu Akbar. The granddaughter of Abu Bakr, the great granddaughter of Abu Bakr. From his both sons put together, Allahu Akbar. So it shows when people try to say Abu Bakr and Umar, uh, they were enemies of the Ahl Bayt. Uh, it's a load of rubbish. Uh, they were really, they looked up to the Ahl, uh, uh, they looked up to Khulafa Rashidun, and Hazrat Abu Bakr, and Hazrat Umar, always took good care of the descendants of Rasulullah. Abu Bakr gave Hazrat Ali a wife, and when in the time of Hazrat Umar, the Persians uh, were defeated, and they, and their and lot of wealth came to Medina, many of their women folk were brought as captives. One of the princes, uh, of Persia, her name was Shahrbanu, uh, one of the princesses when she was brought to Medina, Allahu Akbar, Hazrat Umar radiallahu personally assured, he, he assured that she, one of the princesses was given to the prince of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hazrat Hussein, and Shahrbanu was given by Hazrat Umar to Hazrat Hussein to marry, and she was also by his side in Karbala when he was martyred. And so it, the Khulfa Rashidun always took good care of Hazrat Ali, Hazrat Hassan, Hazrat Hussein radiallahu anhu, Hazrat Hussein giving his daughters to the descendants of Hazrat Usman radiallahu anhu, Allahu Akbar. It showed it was all one big family. Uh, one big family which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had prepared. And they had the immense respect uh, for Abu Bakr and Umar and Usman radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. So now on the channels these people they sit and they, they promote nothing but hatred and jahiliyyah and shows they're absolutely ignorant and jahil of the real state of affairs uh, which existed uh, for centuries. Now all this, as Jafar Sadiq, Imam Jafar Sadiq, he, was, he died in the, in the year 150 after H. And the 10th Imam into, mid, into the well into the 3rd century of Islam, naming his daughter Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, after as Aisha radiallahu anha, it shows for centuries there was no differences. And the differences were brought about later by Kulaini and in recent times by, by Mullah Bakir Majlisi. Otherwise, they were all honorable people. And they all regarded Abu Bakr to the man to be the most deserving to step into the shoes of Rasulullah and to stand in his place. May Allah grant us and their love, love for the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And may Allah keep us as Muslims as long as we live. And when our time comes to leave this world, may Allah take us away on Imam.